name is Mayor Hickey Potters. Uh, one of the uh, 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 here this evening. Uh, we have some special guests here this evening. I'll introduce them in a second, but I'd like to ask everyone to please rise to salute our flag. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm very, very honored uh, to be selected for the East Town Hall meeting. Uh, glad that you all came out. And, uh, I do see some eagles in uh, attire out there, so uh, we'll, we'll get started right away. I just want to introduce our guest this evening. We have Freeholder Director Luca Capelli. We have our U.S. Congressman from the 1st District, Donald Norcross. From the 5th District, we have our State Senator, Nielsa cruz -Bray. And also from the 5th District, Gilbert Whit Wilson. I'm going to turn it over to Gilbert uh, Ah, oh, I do have my counsel here. I, I am my late night to not do that. I have counsel president, Ms. Patty Pascoe. Please stand up. Please stand up. For all the residents here from Ronnie, you should know our I have Councilman Mike Rue. Thank you, Bob. Well, thank all of you for being here. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Um, we're very happy to be here in Runnymede tonight for this town hall meeting, uh, which we began about three or four months ago. This is our third one, and it's a real pleasure to go out to municipalities with every level of government present to be able to ask any or answer any questions you may have and hear your concerns about government. Before we begin, I just want to introduce some of my colleagues from the Board of Freeholders who are here tonight. Deputy Director Ed McDonald is here. He's the Deputy Director. Freeholder Michelle Gentek Mayor. Freeholder John Young. I think that's it. So, who here knows what a freeholder is? Just the freeholders. Okay. It's a question we get often, and I just, I just want to open up uh, before I introduce our other guests uh, we have tonight and turn the mic over to them. The Board of Freeholders is given the charge of, of overseeing the county government. Um, and we're called freeholders. It's a historical term that goes back 200 years because you couldn't be a freeholder unless you, unless you owned land free and clear. Then you can be a freeholder, hence the term. Uh, in other states, it's called county commissioner. Um, and we're very uh, happy to be able to oversee our parks department. We oversee, I think it's 800 miles of, of roads, county roads, um, the uh, jail, the county jail, Camden County College, the Camden County Improvement Authority. Um, we, you know, there's a lot of different functions we perform. Perhaps most importantly, 911 is a county uh, shared service arrangement run by the county, and that's probably one of the most important functions that we have. We also inspect restaurants. We have a health department. Um, so when you, uh, you can actually go online and check out the the reports on the restaurant you might be eating at. So well, there's a lot of good things we do, but most importantly, we work with municipalities like the one here in Marnie to try to make good things happen on, on behalf of the, the people of Camden County. Some of our uh, highlights over the past few months, uh, first, some of you may have read about um, Norman's Law. Uh, that was a, a, a law that we passed, banning the sale of puppies that are born into puppy mills here in Camden County. So. There are no more customers. Yes. That was uh, that effort was led by Freeholder Nash. Uh, just last week, we, got, we announced something called Operation Sal, Operation Save a Life, where we are actually providing treatment for those folks who are addicted to heroin and other drugs and receive our Narcan treatment uh, to save their lives. So what happens is, um, and, and so far, I have to put a, a real shout out here to law enforcement in Camden County. So far this year, police officers in Camden County have saved over 330 lives by giving Martin So what this program does now is to actually do what's called a warm handoff uh, to have the addicts uh, 
provided with some treatment uh, with a, a treatment provider that we've contracted with here in Camden County. So once they're in the emergency room, and all four hospitals are participating in this, um, once they're in the emergency room, we're going to try to get them treated. So we announced that program last week and also gave uh, awards to the over 300 police officers who have saved lives here in, in Camden County. We also in the midst of doing some renovations to uh, Cooper River Park, um, and which is one of our most populated or mostly used parks. And we're also beginning to renovate the gateway into Camden County from Deptford to Runnymede, right here at Elysium. I think the contracts will be awarded. That's something we That was an idea of the governing body here. It's a great idea, and uh, it's going to be a real, very pleasant uh, gateway into Runnymede in Camden County once that project is completed. So it's been my honor to serve uh, on the Fairland Board for all these years, but what makes it very special is to have leaders in Trenton and in Washington to help with some of the initiatives that we try to accomplish here in Camden County. Um, our Congressman Donald Barcross is someone who served us well in Trenton. Uh, while he was in Trenton, he passed some uh, reforms in public safety, in education, uh, all of which have had a tremendous impact in making Camden, Camden, Camden County a safer county and providing greater opportunities for education for people of all backgrounds. And he also was key in development of the Economic Opportunity Act of 2013, which will result in the creation of literally thousands of jobs here in Camden County and a much larger uh, base. So um, we're just so very fortunate to have Donald Norcross as our Congressman. Congressman. Good evening. It's good to be back in uh, Runnymede and uh, certainly uh, Nielsa and Whip are doing a great job and uh, they uh, had the fit pitcher, which was home for, I guess, just close to six years and enjoyed every moment of it. Uh, first, I want to apologize. I assume most people here are football fans. If not, they would be watching the Giants Eagles, which is the number one rivalry in the entire NFL. Uh, our staff that came up with this date was right on ball. They knew that was there. <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. Uh, but the mayor, council, who have always been leading the way, particularly when it came to, or it came to the treatment of our veterans who are returning home, thank you for what you do. We have great events each year. We certainly appreciate it. Uh, November 8th last year was election day. I was sworn in to the U.S. House of Representatives four days later with my grandson standing by my side. It was a... Uh, a remarkable moment uh, because it wasn't too long ago that I was working with the tools as an electrician. I decided to go to that other four-year school that was called an apprenticeship. Then went on to Camden County College and my career went on from there. The reason I tell you this is it's about diversity. You ask most people what do they think about Congress, how is it working, generally not going to hear very good remarks coming back. Some of it is well deserved. And certainly, that's the way I felt going here. And I made the commitment that if I was elected, I'm not going to contribute to the problem. I'm going to try to find a solution. Uh, I was sworn in uh, to the Senate in New Jersey at the same time Governor Christie was sworn in. And nobody was going to suggest that we're on the same page when it comes to many of the important policy issues. But the one thing that we were able to do is something that the founders of our country understood when they put together the Constitution and Congress. It's called compromise. Anybody who's married certainly knows what that word means. And probably on a daily basis. Sometimes you win, sometimes you lose but you always get together. That seems to have been lost uh, to many of those who are serving in Congress. And uh, you can tell that uh, we had Pope Francis down uh, two weeks ago, who came in and spoke to a joint session of Congress. First time ever that the Holy Father has done that. And it was a remarkable moment. Everybody was excited and just thrilled to hear his message. And a reporter talked to me shortly thereafter and says, you think this will make a difference? Being the eternal optimistic, 
I said, I hope it does. Unfortunately, 24 hours later, Speaker Bayer resigned. Mm -hmm. That was only the start of it, because shortly thereafter, the second person in charge was a gentleman named McCarthy, who's a great guy. I think we could uh, work well with him. As they were about to go into the election, he abruptly withdrew. So you need to understand, Speaker of the House, we've all heard about it. It's the third most powerful position in the United States of America. President, Vice President, he's the third one in charge if something goes wrong. It's an incredibly powerful position and one with awesome responsibility. The reason I'm telling you this is just to get a clue of what is going on. And we're now going into a season without a leader that they're now referred to as the calendar of chaos. Okay, sounds something out of Batman. But let me tell you what it means to you in this room. There are three major items that historically have not been major issues in a bipartisan way to pass. The first one comes up October 29th. You know certainly how important this bill is. It's the Highway Trust Fund. It's what is funding our $1.3 billion intersection down here at 42 and 295. And if we don't renew that, that stops. This was never a partisan issue in the history of Congress. It now is. They're doing these small stopgap funding that take it three months, four months. Anybody who owns a business, anybody who does a budget at home understands it's tough to plan ahead when you don't know what's going to happen in two months from now. That predictability is gone, and it, when we want more efficiency of government, we're actually getting less. Then, November 3rd, the full faith and credit of the U.S. government is at stake. It's called the debt levy. Routinely, it is raised to incorporate those dollars that are owed. Now, if we do not pass that, all the bondholders who have credit here in the United States, the Chinese government being the largest, they will get paid before our servicemen and women. That's how bad it's getting. And literally, we won't be able to spend another dime. Only to be overdrawn by December 11th. That's where government shutdown comes again. There is no leader because Brian has indicated that he doesn't want to go into that position of power to be able to work out a deal to compromise because he won't have the backing of his own caucus because he gave in. Even before they knew what the deal was. Now you can tell I'm a little perturbed at this. Government works for you. Sometimes it doesn't work real well, but think of all the things it does. When you go out to the traffic light here in Black Horse Pike and it's green, you're hoping that government has red going the other way. That your firemen, your policemen, this is all good things that government does. The men and women that serve in our armed forces, and I serve on the armed forces or the armed services committee, and we had a briefing last week, and I bring this up, it's just a dedication to the men and women. I sit on a committee called Emerging Threats. I describe it to people, it's the one that you serve on, and when you go to bed at night, you keep one eye open. You can imagine what we're facing as a country. And it is no accident that we have not had a major attack since 9-11. So we get briefed on what is going on around the world. And I'm telling you right now, the reason you're sitting here is because these brave men and women who will never be recognized outside of their small forces because of what they do. It's what government does best. It keeps us safe. I, uh, I could go obviously on forever, but I just want to point out a couple of things that we're here for. I ran a small nonprofit called UOSS. 20 years ago. And what that was instilled to do was to bring community services out to the public. We had an 800 number, 
you now know it as 211. We started that. And we had different levels of the community service. So the federal government was talking to the county, talking to the state. And that was the concept why we're here tonight. Myself, representing the federal government, Lou from the county, Nielsen from the state, Whip from the state, and obviously the mayor and council from the local. So that you can answer or inquire about questions, and you're not saying that, go to the next guy, we don't have the answer. Now we might not have them all tonight, but we got lots of staff here to try to address your questions. And we have a great staff that all of them together have 125 years of experience. And I want to read a letter because I thought it was absolutely phenomenal that we were able to help. And this came from a woman who wanted us to know that we never knew that the services were actually there to help the little guy. Trying to work through the system alone was proving impossible. Your extremely prompt assistance has made all the difference in the world. This isn't a campaign letter. This is what serving the government is all about. Helping those who need the help. Thank you very much. Thank you, Congressman. Our next uh, speaker is the Senator from the 5th District, uh, Nelson Cruz Perez, who uh, began her political career in the Assembly. I think she was, were you the first Latina elected to the New Jersey Assembly? So she's made history in the Assembly. Uh, now she's moved up to the Senate, which is representing the interests of the 5th District in, in an outstanding fashion. Uh, she's a very dedicated public servant, and we're very happy to have her here tonight. Senator Nilsa Cruz Perez. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Senator Nilsa Cruz Perez, and I'm proud to continue to serve you after 15 years representing you as an assembly woman in the General Assembly. I want to take this moment to thank Congressman Donald Norcross and Freeholder Director Luca Pelli for bringing all levels of government under one roof to address the issues. Thank you, Mayor Nick Harrell, for hosting this special event. Uh, I want to congratulate Congressman Norcross in his recent leadership appointment as an assistant whip in the House of Representatives. in Washington, uh, and congratulations. Now we know you're in good hands. Uh, let me tell you about uh, what committees I'm sitting in Trenton. I sit on the Senate Economic Growth uh, Committee as a vice chair. This is a very, very important committee because in this committee we address, we address the issues affecting the businesses and the economy in New Jersey. I've been working with the Chambers of Commerce, I've been working with the local businesses, I've been working with the people in the community uh, to try to create key legislation, not to only keep the businesses in New Jersey, but also bring in new businesses in New Jersey, because we need the jobs. Um, I also sit in the Transportation Committee, and I don't have to tell you how important it is to keep safe roads. It's not only vital for our economy, but it's also it's for the safety and the well-being of our family and friends. And the last committee I'm serving is a committee that I'm very proud to serve. It's in the Committee of Military and Veterans Affairs. In this committee, I have sponsored many pieces of legislation to protect our veterans. One of them that I'm very proud is the Stolen Valor Act, which will make a crime for someone who tried to impersonate a veteran. Uh, believe it or not, or not people, will have, people will do that just to gain services and goods that are provided to our veterans. Do we have any veterans in the room? This has done to me. Thank you so much for your service. I also want to recognize uh, police and firefighters in the room that work very hard to keep us safe. Thank you for your service. The best ideas come from the people. Linda can tell you that. So we're looking forward to, um, to hear your concerns, to hear ideas, so we can propose legislation and make New Jersey a better place to live. God bless you. Thank you, Senator. 
Our next speaker is someone who uh, spent his entire career as a police officer in Camden City and put his life on the line day in and day out on behalf of the residents of that city. And he's very well, well respected and eventually was elected to the state legislature as an assemblyman. He's giving back to his community still as a member of the assembly. He has helped to pass legislation uh, that uh, we talked about earlier, the Economic Opportunity Act. Um, he stood with Camden County with the development of a county police force, um, even though it wasn't a popular thing for him to do, especially as a resident of Camden and a former police officer. But he knew what was right. He knew what the best action was for his residents. And he always puts the interests of his residents first, as some of them in Wilson. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. I'm back. Let's talk back. <laughs> Please. As again, we're crossing here in the State Assembly. My committees are your love these. My first committee is military vets. I'm a natural for that, I think. I'm a Vietnam veteran. Uh, my second committee is uh, law and public safety. I think I'm a natural for that, being a police officer. And my third committee is agriculture. I heard that there. <laughs> and so did I laugh too, they gave me agriculture. I'm the vice chair of agriculture, a Camden City kid. Agriculture. Now I know about agriculture is very, I guess, small in a way. I knew about Camden City. <laughs> and we had a thing in Camden called tomato season. Now August, tomato trucks would line up, he knows about that, would line up blocks, blocks, tomatoes going to the plant. And some way, somehow, these baskets of tomatoes just fall off the truck. <laughs> right in front of us, guys. We would have, let's have to have salt with us at the time also. So, um, I think the attempt limitation is passed for that one. I think it all is well. Now, you talk about veterans, they're very close to my heart for various reasons. And a lot of times you get ideas about passing various bills from folks just like you sitting out there. I had a veteran who served overseas. While overseas, he was on a list to be a police officer. Well, the list expired. I was overseas serving as a technician. He came back and wanted to take the test over again, paid the fee. I said, it's not fair, it's not right. So I put him in place a bill that says, if you're a police officer or firefighter, you're deployed overseas, and there is an active list, and it expires while you're overseas. When you come back home, the new list, you're going right away. So that's a bill that was signed by the government. So for our veterans who are serving us, who are in public safety particularly, that was a big thing for me to do. That's one of my first things I got signed. <laughs> when I get a bill moving, I try to make sure that, for the most part, I can get support on both sides of the house. I work very hard at doing this. And sometimes it's not very successful because other side does not listen all the time. Um, right now I'm fussing about tax reductions for senior citizens. Now think about this. Senior citizens who are actually paying the full weight of the school tax. That's not fair. So I believe seniors should get a tax break on the school portion of the property tax. That's the job we need to do. Another one I'm talking about, weapons-free school zones. Now, this bill is an old one. The fact that matters, I was in the, I was in the city council in Camden, I passed an ordinance, weapons-free school zones. So we have it in Camden City, but of course the penalty is not as stiff if there's a state law. So I'm going to get this done in the state now. But it's so difficult. As soon as you say weapons, there are some folks who get upset about taking their guns. This bill does not take nobody's guns. Matter of fact, I had somebody from the NRA to call my office complaining. So let me explain the bill. Are you ready? Well, no, you're going to take my gun. I'm taking your gun from This is what the bill is all about. All we're doing is adding another law to an existing law that says if you have a weapon, and the word here, illegal weapon in a school zone, you have committed a crime. Well, the supposedly I got my gun and I'm going to the store. 
You can't do that now. If you're going to the shooting range or hunting, you can go from your home to the range, back to your home, hunting, from your home, hunting, back. You can't stop no place. Am I correct on that? That's what the law says now. All I'm saying this law is, if you have a legal weapon within the school zone, there'll be a harsher penalty. Now, the school zone, when I told the guy this thing, he said, oh, that sounds good to me. I said, okay, you support this? Oh, I can't do that. And all right, can I say yes and support something like that? But it makes sense to me that we should get this done. So I'm fighting now because some of you might hear the rumor I'm leaving the assembly for something else, hopefully. I want to get this done before I move on. So it's very difficult sometimes to get these things done. I call them all. Uh, it makes sense, the common sense. But I found out, and Trenton and Washington too, common sense ain't common. It is. You think things make sense to you, but sometimes other people doesn't make no sense whatsoever. So hopefully I get that Weapons Free School Zone um, passed before I leave and go on to other things, hopefully. God bless you all. Give any questions. Thank you, Senator. But the next uh, part of the meeting, we turn the meeting over to you uh, for your questions and comments. We will ask you to raise your hand. Uh, we have two gentlemen, uh, one to my left, one to my right, and we'll call upon you. Unfortunately, we don't have a microphone in the audience tonight, but you'll be able to uh, state your question and the appropriate uh, member of the panel will, will answer. So, uh, Anthony, we'll start on this side. Any questions, comments? This side? There we go. I thought we might see the pregame show there for a minute. Back there. Adam, put your hand up. 
He is a fellow with our office, just came to us by way of Wounded Warriors. You will not find a better advocate for veterans. He and Leanne do a great job. So we can make sure you touch base and we'll try to get that done. Thank you. Jersey is in a very difficult spot. We're in the older Northeast where we have a high cost of living because people make a decent wage and have something called a pension. That's a driving force. We're in competition not only in Philadelphia, Delaware, New York, but the Rust Belt and certainly the Sun Belt who create incentive programs to lure companies away from us. And that has been happening at a good pace and certainly was uh, uh, even became quicker during the great recession that we just went through. That was the basis for the Economic Opportunity Act. Whether you agree or don't agree with the incentive programs, the fact is that's the game that's being played out there. And if we look back over the course of the last decade, particularly in the city of Camden, Pennsylvania, and others, what happens if you do nothing, you end up losing that. They'll be here and they'll stay here because we have a great workforce, but they pay for a good workforce. So you have to balance that in some way and make a decision to bring those in. So over the course of the last six months, roughly, you have heard announcements coming out literally on a weekly basis, but they come through EDA on a monthly basis. Whole tech. Uh, this is just one company I want to talk about. Dr. Singh came over here as a young boy, penniless. Put himself through school, got a scholarship at the University of Pennsylvania, and built a world-renowned company that deals in power plants. He has a plan out in Pittsburgh that he was going to move down to South Carolina, or literally out of the country. If it wasn't for the incentives that we set up, and Dr. Singh could have taken his play anywhere in the world. He wanted a workforce from New Jersey that he knew had high skill trades, but most importantly had a feeder program for STEM, the sciences and math. He's developing the next generation of small modular reactors and needs scientists to help him with that. That's just one case. There are, and do you know we build that or make eggs here in Camden County? Blue Anchor. No, not me. As I, I, one of my first jobs as a young apprentice, they made one at a time in a big carousel. They were just awarded a grant because they were going to move out, and now they're going to stay and expand their uh, facility. I think it's a $20 million project. So that's what we're doing to try to create that, an incentive to not only keep the companies here, but to build them. Because once they move out of the state, all that income, that people were accustomed to is gone. So we're in a battle back and forth with Pennsylvania, New York, Delaware, and certainly the rest of the country. And this is one that actually is making a great difference. Appreciate your question. Sharks win. Good question. 
We'll either get those or the Phillies, whatever. It's a great question, and for those of you, it's Social Security each year in the third quarter does a calculation for inflation. And over the past 30 years, it has averaged 4.1% a year. That's not happening this year. That's the, the truth about it. Because the measurements, what they take that on gasoline and fuel and heating is a large part of that. We've done pretty well in that with a 30% drop. So that calculation in there, and this is one year only, they do it in the third quarter of each year. So Social Security is not getting a bump this year. Over the last 10 years, it's been averaging 2.1%. That money that comes in also affects what you pay for your Medicare. So they can't go above the 70% rate. So depending on your family income and other issues, that rate isn't going to go up unless you're involved with some of the other issues with it. And uh, Freeholder Capelli has the inside track on the uh, River Shark stuff. So. Uh, whether or not the River Sharks will be there next year has not yet been determined. Um, Camden County did purchase the stadium, uh, Campbell's Field. Uh, it's also used by Rutgers, by high school teams as well. Um, the River Sharks uh, weren't paying all the debt on that, on that building, and, and so there was a shortfall, and through a series of different foreclosures, the county now owns the property. We're in discussion with other potential users of the property, but if you have vouchers, we'll make sure whoever the end user is honors your vouchers. All right? It might be the Philadelphia Phillies the way they're playing. Dave, I've known you many, many years. A Giants jersey? Yeah. Really? yeah. A so Camden right. County kid? Yeah. So you were willing to help you. That's okay. I have, I have very broad shoulders. 
Who ever went to Chubby's restaurant in West Collington Heights? That's the Walker family right there. An institution in Camden County. But that's uh, Second, the second part of my question, I just was curious, are there any plans to rebuild Clemens Bridge and when do you know that'll happen? Actually, um, that design is taking place right now and we expect to award the contracts next year. That's awesome. So that is happening. And we're also, um, at the, as I think I mentioned earlier at the request of the governing body, uh, rebuilding and redesigning the gateway uh, from Defford into Runnymede. So it's gonna have a whole great look at Clemens Bridge Road that we've done next year. It'll be great. Go Weavers. Uh, good evening. I have, I'm a veteran. Okay, I have um, been in this township for 30 years. I'm paying $7,800 in taxes. I'm a senior citizen. I have the option of retiring for two months. I have the option of my staying or my moving. And that's a change. It really is. So, even though you're giving me 250 off my taxes because I'm a veteran, you're going to jack up with them in, in the next year anyway, so it really don't make a difference. So, how can I possibly stay in my house for 30 years that I've been there, and now I've got an option to move? And that's a shame, it really is. <laughs> the thing is, the Terrible Post has a big thing about it now. If you can't vote for it, then help us out with these taxes, even drop them down, then you're going to be out of a job. So we all don't make it different. So, congratulations. Yeah, I got 7,800 bucks. I don't know if I'm going to retire or I'm going to still, still be working. I've never seen so many vacant houses in London in my life. Uh, 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 so now I have to say something. Now we're just going to see what you got these people, people are going to do. The carrier post has already got a big thing about it. Sign it. And if you can't help us out, then we have to have you go. And yeah, it's so a shame, I'm like, sorry to say this. So, so I can tell you, speak for the county level. At the county level, we've been um, keeping um, taxes as low as possible. We've increased them less than 2% over the last three years. Um, you have a 2% tax. And that's well, actually, it, it does go beyond that. But what I can tell you is we look at every line item every year do what we can to provide uh, the best services we can at the, at, at the price we can. So on, on the county, on your tax bill, the smallest portion is probably your municipality and your county. The biggest portion are, are the school taxes. And the driving force behind why property taxes are so high in New Jersey is the way we pay for our schools. And, um, you know, it's a very, very regressive tax system because our schools are paid by property taxes, which are based not on your income, but on the value of your home. And there's not a more regressive way to tax people, quite frankly. So, uh, frankly, we can do what we can at the county level, and I know that this municipality does a great job in, in trying to keep spending low. Um, but for us to provide the basic minimum services that we provide, including the jail, uh, maintaining roads, maintaining 911, um, there's a certain cost that go along with that. And, and, and we're at a point where any drastic reduction, any further drastic reduction in, in spending by the county will severely impact services. Uh, a few years ago, we, uh, and this wasn't an easy thing to do, we laid off 250 county employees. 250 people who lived in Camden County. We laid them off because uh, of the recession, revenues were not keeping up with expenses, and it was a very tough decision. We had to do it, and as a result, we're down to really the minimum size of government that we can have and still provide the county services. So really the change needs to be made uh, at a much bigger level. And to me the change is not relying on property taxes to pay for schools, but to rely on taxes where uh, there's a much more progressive way to tax people who have the income and not tax people based solely on their property which they've owned forever. And you want your property to appreciate value. It doesn't necessarily mean you can afford to pay higher taxes. So. Uh, Stay from How's it going to change? Yeah. Um, you know, there was one governor who changed it. Um, I happen to know him pretty well. He was from this area. From and when he did that, um, and he took the burden off of property taxes and put it on something different, he was voted out of office. So uh, I think there's a real fear amongst folks uh, to do that. But it has to change in Trenton, quite frankly. 
sales tax, which is based on some of the spending. What is your income tax? So I don't disagree with you. Uh, it should be based on income. Uh, that would take a, a change in the Constitution of the state of New Jersey. Yeah, it, it would take an actual constitutional convention to change the Constitution, which dictates um, Well, I'm blaming the no, 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 I'm blaming the system. The system out there. Now, the guys out there are the are in the public and the workers. So, things that should be happening for us in the government, because we're going to fight you with the government. I would say, uh, in the last <laughs> six to seven years, South Jersey has gotten more than it's ever gotten the state of New Jersey, thanks to the leadership of the people sitting at this table, quite frankly. Uh, the Economic Opportunity Act of 2013 was designed specifically to benefit South Jersey. Until that act, all those benefits and tax incentives that were creating jobs, they were all in North Jersey. They were all in North Jersey. For the first time, we in South Jersey can take the benefit of some of those incentives and, and create jobs. They were to come if they had to pay that. system by design to suggest that nothing is being done. There are lots of options, but you have to make a tough decision. You want to cut your tax rate for your housing? Biggest driver of teachers? Policemen. I think they do a pretty damn good job. They like to take care of their family. So how do we take care of that? You have to say to the young lady over there, oh, we're going to cut your salary by 30% because that's what they pay in South Carolina. We have 537 municipalities. Over the course of the last decade, two have merged. That means you have a police chief, a police chief, a police chief. These all add up. There are drivers to this that we can easily do, but you have to make a decision collectively. We were looking at Berlin, Borough, and Township, couldn't put that together. Everybody likes to have their police chief. I understand that. The mayor wants to be able to call the chief up and say, we got a problem, let's go fix it. You don't feel the same if you're in a regional course. The reality is a little bit different. I read all seven papers from the Gannett. They did a pretty good job of laying it out. But us collectively, as citizens, have to make those tough decisions. Pensions, huge driver. The investments aren't coming back the way they used to. We had to fill those back. And they're not filled to where they should be either. These are all tough questions. On top of that, the federal government. Because what happens is in New Jersey, we're competing for businesses, for residents. So when they start driving it down, and this started probably about 70 years ago, when the South really started booming with the lower cost wages. Then it went because of NAFTA, Mexico and Central America. Now we're in a global competitive market. The, all the rules for blue collar jobs like us got cut in half. That's the real reality. Manufacturing of RCA. I live in the building where my dad's first job was down at the Vicar. They used to employ thousands of people. New York Shipyard had 24,000 people on its side there. The manufacturing isn't here because we're all getting undercut by overseas. That's the true driver of what's going on. 
That's why I voted against the Trade Act. This is not good for America because we're not competing on a fair level. So when we have these questions, we're not here because we want to be popular. I want to be able to help the kids that are going to school, our next generation, who quite frankly are falling further and further behind. I want to make sure those jobs are there. I represent people who are out of work for almost three years. They went through their life savings, went through their pension and annuity, and fell into disrepair, fell into drugs and alcohol, and killed themselves because they didn't have a job. Believe me, I know what it's like. I've seen it and I live it every day, and that's why I'm fighting so hard to make sure that our economy comes back. Where, I'm sorry? Let me tell you, the number one driver is called the Armed Services of America. That's where, that's where the vast majority, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, big drivers, what they call the entitlements, number one driver. I couldn't hear you. We all do. Now let me give you, here is a nice, simple way to address Social Security. Does anybody, I remember years ago, we used to top out and think we got a little raise somewhere in November. I think it's uh, 117,000, 118 this year. And then you get that little raise, right? Donald Trump gets it in the first week and doesn't have to pay it anymore. I have a very simple solution. Take the caps off. It's only helping a million years to get away. That will fix Social Security for the next 30 years. Because they're about to start coming back on Social Security disability also, for those who need it worse. For which? Okay, great question. This, actually, this is very good to have this discussion. He says, why not have means testing for Social Security? How many people have paid in Social Security over 10 years? 20 years. Okay. If you means test that you make over 30,000, take this move in half, say thank you for your contribution. If you means test it, half the people in this room will probably be over that line. They're making enough through pensions or whatever savings they have. That's the means testing you're talking about. That's what means testing is. You're, we're getting to the same spot. If you raise it for millionaires, you're not raising enough income. There's not that many millionaires that it makes any measurable difference on whether Social Security lives or dies. Because you hear about the one percenters? That's why they call them one percenters. There's only one percent out there. So if you means test them, they cut them off. So great, you got one percent out of the way. He's still left with 99 percent. The math doesn't work. Great bank, Bill Ward did a nice job there, and his legacy he lives on today. Well, we're not here to build, beat up Bill Ward because he has given back to this community. We can go all around Camden County for things he has given back. So whether or not he deserves Social Security, the guy's not here to defend himself. He's dead, so leave it. Do we have another question?
the reason that my sister was given is because he receives an income, which is, yes, which is his survivor benefit. Yes. So while my sister, she has an older daughter who is perfectly healthy, so my sister and my niece do have medical insurance as well as survivor benefits. He gets survivor benefits, but no medical insurance because they're saying he has an income. He has five specialists, otolaryngologists, endocrinologists, pulmonologists, specialty dentists. He is overdue. He's on the thyroid medication. The endocrinologist won't keep giving him prescriptions if she can't get him one. With no medical insurance, these doctors, being the specialists that they are, you know, are just too much for us. You know, I mean, I try to help her out. Um, I'm a little older than she is. <laughs> but, you know, I'm just, we don't know where to go. We really don't. There are a couple programs, and I'm not sure what we're going to be talking about. But let's talk about means testing right now, because that's a form of means testing. It's called income. These are difficult questions that nobody likes to think about. You, know, you want to make sure that there's not another nine eleven. So we invest billions and trillions of dollars making sure that we're safe. We can always cut a billion dollars out. And we'll probably get through it. But what level are you willing to sacrifice? Any of you to cut that? That's a tough, tough decision. So when we talk about means testing, yeah, it helps us, but there's also the human face right here. It's not an easy question. Hey, I'm with disability, my wife works. She she doesn't take medical insurance for his job. He doesn't qualify for uh, Obamacare. So we're walking around. I, I don't qualify for things. I have a heart attack six months ago. I can't buy any my my bed. May I ask you, sir, when do you have children from the children? Yeah, we're all Okay, did they go to schools and receive good education? We want him. I have a grandson who's in high school. I understand that, but while someone else paid for your child's good education through their tax dollars, we then, being all the human race, we then ask you to do the same for our children. Our children will do the same for the next generation. What a Unfortunately, what that's the way This is great for an illustration on the issues that literally come up every day because it's not now an option here in Trenton. Now, there is no boogeyman that's sitting there saying, let's screw the little guy. It's actually the opposite. Regulation. You hear it day in and day out how it's choking us. Well, New Jersey, Governor Florio, the new congressman, did super fun act. Why? Because they have places like Innsbruck, right? One of the hottest areas around in terms of old lead paint. We had wealth back down in Gloucester City. They dumped radioactive waste. All that costs money. And for anybody who's an elected official, forget that. Anybody who runs a budget at home, where are we going to spend it? We're going to go out to dinner tonight, we're going to buy the kids some shoes. This happens day in and day out. We're no different, but the numbers are much larger. We are literally driving. I got great friends on the other side of the aisle. Maybe a little different than they want to go about it. The dysfunction that's going on now is quite different than any other time in our history. I would say number one reason. You're driving people either way because of the lack of campaign finance. This one. When that Supreme Court decision came out saying corporations can give, which means individual, if I'm a multi billionaire, dropping a couple million is nothing to me. And that's the problem right now. Everybody is afraid of getting primary. Nobody wants to tell you that, but that's a real driver here. 
and they come up and make compromise. Eric Cantor was the number two guy in the Republic. He got wiped out last year. I got sworn in with it, and who replaced him? Compromise is a dirty word. And that's the problem until we fix the campaign finance. None of this long term is going to change. Nationally, it's remarkable. There was a series in the Amy show where all money comes from. And there's a few zip codes that can trust. It's the one percent. That's the truth. Thank you. 
got. I'm a 57-year-old person who's been out of work, let's put it this way, past a seven-year point. I find that every time I go to apply for work, whether it's minimum wage or not, what do I have? I got a 16-year-old getting a damn job. I don't get hired, it's age discrimination. In this state alone, there's a lot of people, and I gotta say this, there's people in this room that got relatives who are out of work, who've been out of work since 2006 crisis. That's when I lost my job. And, hey, it's not easy. You bring jobs into New Jersey, these jobs in New Jersey, these employers sit back and they say, oh, but we don't want to raise the minimum wage because, well, if we do, we're going to have to pay more money. So therefore, we're not going to hire. That's why we put it on the ballot. We got rid of veto, didn't we? put it on the ballot, and now each year we'll and 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 bring it to the Because Congress needs to, say, to, st to stand up and say, your Congress will stand up and say, hey, look, your constituents are saying this too. We can't live on minimum wage. $8.38 does not pay for rent does not pay to feed people, does not pay anything. This country needs to get down to a point that says this. If you are between the ages of, eight, of 16 and 18 years old, and you're living in your parents' house, they're paying all the bills, and if you're working, okay, it's spending money. But the rest of us who have to work and have to pay all our bills, we cannot live on minimum wage. We need to live on a living wage of at least $15 an hour. Well, listen, I want to thank you for that, but let's make two points. Number one, age discrimination, both on the state and federal level, is illegal. We'll put you in touch with the Department of Labor, the federal, state, depending on what your particular issue. But let's talk about the 18, 19, 20, 21 year old. We're not going to go through and start saying, gee, mom, maybe you're good, you're good, not yours. They're the ones who fight for us every day. They're the ones who join the army. They're the ones who join the Navy. So I don't want to start going after the millennials. I've worked 30 years of my life. Ma'am, let you have a chance. Let me have it. It's not about providing the public. We're all in this together. And I thank those young men and women because they're the ones who so, are So, so, so what? Let's so in the military. Yes, I have relatives who served in the military. My father was a military veteran. I thank them. I go out like that. I see him, see him in the street at the airport, at the bus station. I walk up to him. I don't know them. I give him a big hug and say, thank you very much. I challenge everybody to say that to the veterans. By the way, so I started a living wage campaign 15 years ago in the city of Okay, but I like I said, like I said, it's something a living wage, a living wage campaign. Living That's wage. not going. But I'll tell you now, 15 years later, I'm a little bit older and live through it. We put in that wage that's so high here. All those incentives that we had to bring companies here start to work against us. Right? You were a contractor, low bid. That's what we run into. So it's called a balance in there. But the best way to address your issue is get the economy going to raise everybody back. So we have time for two more questions. And what do you do? Good. Uh, Hi, I'm Jennifer of our budget is spent on public safety. And what that is is the county jail, 911, sheriff's department, department of corrections. That's over 60% of our budget. We are working very hard right now, and actually some, some legislation passed by the folks here, the Bail Reform Act. We are a pilot county program. The Bail Reform Act is intended on keeping those uh, offenders who are not violent and charged with some low offense out of jail. If we're able to reduce our jail population by the amount we think we're about to reduce it right now, we're at about 1,400, Ross? 1,500, we're up to 1,500. By the way, our, our jail's rated for 900. Okay. Um, 
This bail reform act that these three folks right here were very instrumental in passing, we think we'll be able to get our jail population down to 700. That's conservative. That will drastically reduce our expenses. So, so when the congressman talks about entitlements and defense, um, we're on a different level. We have a jail, we have a sheriff's department, we have 911, which by the way, we are one of the few counties in the state of New Jersey, perhaps the only one, to have a completely regional 911 uh, system. So we, you know, we as a county pay, oh, yes we are, sir. Are you gonna disagree with me? That's fine. So, um, and our 911 is very highly rated, does an outstanding job, but over 60% of our budget is related directly to public safety. Every call is taken. So, if you'd like to call, go to it. If you get money, can it go? We had a director of mother service. I have to talk. Um, I also want to thank our congressman, our senator, okay. our senior president. Um, before you leave, there are plenty of resources here tonight from Camden County, the state of New Jersey, and the Congress's office, the Veterans Affairs Office of Camden County, Camden County College. Uh, so please take advantage of the resources. Go Eagles! Thank you, Ronnie, for hosting us. Thanks for coming out tonight.